headlines have been going around. Tongkat Ali does not improve testosterone. It does not improve lean body mass. So we're going to take a look at this study today. Yeah, um, there's quite a few studies on Tongkat Ali, and this one is particularly interesting because it's been making social media rounds, and perhaps the takeaway that people are getting on Reddit and Twitter is not necessarily the takeaway that you should have. Yep, so we'll talk about the study design, some of the methods that were used, some of our things we think were done well, things that were not done so well, and let you know if you should stop taking Tom Kettley altogether. Yeah, um, we'll provide the study link below and some of our interpretation, but we've done several podcasts on Tongkat Ali before. A brief overview is that um, it is also known as Long Jack, and it's been used in both testosterone boosters and in uh, libido pills, uh, for <laughs> whatever you want to call them, gas station pills, for quite some time, usually in combination with things like Tribulus Terrestris, um, and for listeners of the Huberman Lab podcast, often in combination with Fidoja. And we've discussed some of the theoretical concerns with any sort of testosterone supplement. Again, there's not really anything such as a testosterone booster, uh, but if you have something like low insulin or low IGF-1, certainly uh, utilizing compounds that have been studied in uh, herbal medicine and clinically for quite some time can be reasonable uh, as it does seem to have benefit. And another nice thing about Tomcat is people can usually tell when they're taking it. Um, yes, more placebo-controlled studies are needed, but um, we will answer some very basic questions about this specific study. Welcome back to the Gillette Health Podcast, where we give you tools to develop a balanced approach for health. I'm Dr. Taylor Martin. And I'm James O'Hara, nurse practitioner. On this podcast, like Dr. Martin said, we give you tools and not medical advice. So you've got a disguise on today. And uh, we did some detective work and I think unpacked the disguise of this study, if you will. Um, maybe we call this podcast, Tongkat Ali Doesn't Work. Yeah, or does it? Or we don't know how to design a study to show if it works, but we got a grant, so we'll take the money. <laughs> yep. but, so uh, this study was entitled, The Effect of Tongkat Ali Supplementation on Body Composition in exercise trained males and females. So I was very excited to see a females. study. Separate of, data for both of them. Since we'll get I'm, into that. Yeah. <laughs> oh. I was excited to see a study on a popular supplement. Uh, and then the first thing I saw in the materials and methods, I know you're not supposed to read that part, just go to the conclusion and then share it on Twitter. Or even better, don't open the paper, but just repost somebody's tweet. Oh. That's a strategy. <laughs> even even better, because sometimes the abstract has something in it that's problematic as well. Yeah, so this was, I saw it was a you know, randomized, double-blinded, placebo-controlled trial. And I thought that's great. Um, I saw it's a popular supplement. They looked at testosterone levels. Primary author is one of the heads of the ISSN who wrote an article that I actually love. Uh, he wrote um, with Dr. Bill Campbell and Brad Schoenfield the ISSN's position on caffeine in sports as a performance enhancing supplement, yeah. which is a great paper, by the way, um, in contrast to this one, unfortunately. Yeah, so my first disappointment or letdown was salivary testosterone levels. Uh, this isn't really Ooh. anything I think that is used clinically. Um, certainly the endocrine society guidelines or urology is not using salivary testosterone to make any diagnoses or management decisions. Yep. Um, but there's a number of sort of good things and bad things about the paper. But before we get into that, um, I guess we can talk about who were the participants in the study. So there's 34 of them. Yep. They Males and females. Men and women, which, you know, Tonkat Ali can affect both men and women. Yep. Uh, regular exercisers of at least three times a week aerobic exercise and or resistance training. Mm -hmm. So that was sort of a, a vague thing there in the methods and materials, but uh, they're actually pretty well trained when you look at the characteristics. So uh, they had been training, um, you know, 19 years on average in the Tom Kettley group, nine years on average in the placebo group, mm -hmm. and for um, about nine, 
eight, nine hours per week of exercise, yeah. which is a, a pretty substantial amount. Quite a bit. These are not newbies. So you would expect them to be wanting to break through plateaus. And some people ask, you know, I'm a, a experienced um, exerciser, if you will. Should I use Tongcat to get more jacked and less fat? Or should I use TRT to get more jacked and less fat or something else? Um, so it's a decent clinical question. And yes, their primary endpoint that they were studying was body composition. In hindsight, they really should have added Dr. Grant Tinsley to their research as well so that he could have helped them with their body composition assessment and how they did their in-body scans. Or um, So but we'll get that to that later. Um, looking at this data, I found it interesting that, you know, uh, it's only 34 people, but um, the age average in the Tonkat group was 37 but in placebo, it was 30. And the average number of total years of training was about twice as much in the Tonkat group. Yeah, I think that was interesting. Um, they also split up, and this wasn't in the chart for some reason, but males and females. So they had 11 males, five females in the Tonkat Ali group, and eight males, nine females in the placebo group. So Which group do you think had higher average testosterone? The group with more females or less females? Well, if we skip ahead, it was actually the placebo group that had the highest average starting free testosterone. Maybe that's because you had older participants in the Tonkat Ali group. Uh, we can talk about SHBG, older people, Not or a, SHBG. Yeah. But Ab it's not a huge difference. Average age was still only 37. Yeah, not a huge so difference. So not old enough to where you, 37 plus or minus 14. So um, some of the oldest in the Tonkat group would be 50. And at 50, your SHBG usually isn't that sky high. It, it's really, you know, 60, 70, exponentially increasing with age. Mm -hmm. So yeah, um, or perhaps the uh, the group with lower total Testosterone is different than the group with lower free testosterone. So again, if it's salivary testosterone, if it's low, that um, is testosterone that is metabolized that has gotten into the saliva. Yeah. Yeah. It's assumed to be free testosterone, not bound to SHBG. Yes. So um, starting body composition, considering this is pooled, these people were pretty lean. So the average was about 20% plus or minus, and that includes mm -hmm. the females in the group as well. Yep. So, you know, female at 20% is ex extremely lean. Maybe not uh, on in-body. Yeah. Well, that's true. It is in-body. I'm thinking DEXA. Yeah. So we don't know. Their body composition was somewhere between 10 and 30% as far as body fat percentage to start. Yep. And they had them fast for three hours before getting their in-body. So kind of interesting choice with the three-hour fast. Um, as far as I remember, there was not a like significant instructions on what to do with the carbs in your diet or, um, you know, the how many hours from exercise. Must you be exercise fasted, not within 12 hours or whatnot, mm -hmm. for regaining um, the extracellular fluid versus intracellular fluid. So, Yeah, they didn't give them any training or diet instructions other than to not make changes. So yep. they wanted them to continue their normal eating, their normal training, yep. and see sort so of what good. the supplement was doing. But to your point, it would make sense to at least, you know, rest for 12, 24 hours yep. untrained before getting it. And maybe you're doing the in-body at baseline also, like, you know, you have 16 ounces of water in the morning, and then you go get your in-body. Uh, because depending on the salt content of your diet, you could be holding different amounts of water that's going to show up differently. Yep. Um, so a, a little bit interesting here, especially because when they, I mean, I, other than time, I don't see a reason why they shouldn't separate out the male and female participants when it comes to percent body fat, um, lean body mass, considering that is the primary endpoint that they're looking at. Yeah. And I mean, it, it does seem like in the literature that in a say 12 week training block, that's usually about the best you get for our lean body mass yep. accrual that women put on a similar amount proportionally to their body mass. So yep. if they weigh 120 pounds, you know, they could add, you know, X percent of that to their body weight, same as a male who weighs 200 pounds. You know, it's going to be relatively the same, but in absolute terms, which this is measuring, there's going to be 
some big, big differences potentially. Yeah, but if these females are in their 20s, 30s, and 40s, there's a good chance at least some of them are on hormonal contraception, which <clears throat> of course is very hormonally active. So presumably they think that, or in fact, they mentioned the mechanism of Tonkat as improving body composition is secondary to hormone changes like testosterone. And I do think that a case could be made that the lower your insulin and the lower your DHEA and perhaps the lower your testosterone, Tonkat could work better. And it may work better in females that have some degree of um, feedback inhibition for at least ovarian hormone production, if not adrenal hormone production that are on oral contraceptives. So um, lots of interesting things. Uh, if anybody from this group or their friends are listening, then we would be happy to help with future studies from the hormonal standpoint or body composition standpoint. And I'm sure Grant Tinsley would be happy to help with that as well. Yeah, absolutely. There's a lot of good things that were done here. We're just sort of pointing out what we would have you know, like to see or the most ideal scenario where this is studies the free can always peer be there. review, but just after they publish. <laughs> post-publication peer review. Yes, feel free to review our articles and try to dumpster them as well. Yeah, uh, so now looking at the results, right? So what happened, um, you know, the retweets that we saw were sharing, it's like, oh, does Tom Kettley work according to new study? No, it doesn't. Hmm. But then if you actually look at the results here, you see that the free testosterone, so this is the salivary testosterone, um, actually increased 58 picogram per ml in the treatment group. Yep. And the placebo group saw a 32 picogram per ml decrease. So that's, what does that work out to? About a 90 picogram per ml net change there, a difference between the two groups. Yeah. And I mean, if Pretty these large were- large change. Yeah, as far as a percent there, that is, let's, let's say the average starting point is 250 and you've got a 90 point change. That's- over a third, Can so that's like a thirty-three yeah. percent relative difference between the groups, which seems sounds pretty like significant. a big difference. And you I'm could, trying you to make that as the title: Tonkat Ali increases testosterone by thirty-three percent in one month. Thirty-three percent relative difference in testosterone, or Tonkat Ali and placebo group. Yep. Um, let's put that as the title of this video because it's not technically wrong. It's no more technically wrong that than Tonkat Ali does not increase testosterone. Yeah, that's the, fair. The data are the data. So yeah, we can benevolently on, clickbait a title if we want to. <laughs> depends on how you want to present the data. So looking at the free testosterone numbers from another study, we tried to make some correlations to like, you know, salivary testosterone. I'll say <clears> I, <throat> I'm not, yep. I never ordered one, so, never will. It's not used clinically. But to make the case of like, okay, if we did use it clinically, what does the data show us this correlates with like your total testosterone or mm -hmm. your free testosterone? Try to translate the data into numbers that people can understand. Um, basically, what was the free testosterone level if you convert it to a serum or a blood testosterone? You know, you, mm -hmm. you give blood. What are these people's free T when they start and they stop? And um, ideally, what's the free T for the male group and the female group? Because they have that, right? No, they pooled them together, which initially I thought could be masking the effect of a potential testosterone increase, but they were measuring the relative change and that's what they have plotted. And the, the graphics that keep getting circulated around is these uh, sort of, I believe it's not, it's a forest plot, I believe is what they have. Um, showing the differences or lack thereof in their opinion. But no, unfortunately, they didn't stratify the data or do it. I mean, it's too small to do a statistically powered subgroup analysis, but you could have at least showed the pre and post data for males and females who have very different levels of testosterone. Yeah, unless they're bodybuilders. That's true. If you had a bunch of jacked chicks and a bunch of not jacked dudes, then they could have very similar amounts of lean mass. Yeah. An average free testosterone, by the way, was between 35.2 nanograms per deciliter and 42.3 nanograms per deciliter using kind of like the least bad conversion study that we can find. Yeah. So um, there's a paper from the 80s that yeah. suggests that a, with a salivary testosterone of 84, 
that your free testosterone would be 11.9. So using that same ratio, their starting testosterone, free testosterone would have been 35.2, which for reference, that would be a total testosterone, assuming albumin 4.9, SHBG of 30, a starting testosterone of 1400. And remember, there are females pooled in this group as well. That should be the title. Tonkat increases free testosterone by 7.1 nanograms per deciliter. Tonkat Ali increases free testosterone to over 40 nanogram per deciliter. <laughs> That's even better. Yeah. yeah, I don't know. I mean, average male and female testosterone, I don't even know if Chris Bumstead and his wife would have an average free testosterone of that. Because this is probably off-season averaging 30 to 40. Yeah, and, and if their testosterone levels are that high, the amount of lean body mass there is kind of embarrassing. So if these are people that are already juicing ah. to the gills, presumably they... So you're excluded. saying that they're natty. So basically... I would it's assume like a, they're natty. Like being like, no, I really think you're natural is, <laughs> is a really nice insult. It can uh, be. Yep. So um, the increase in... Free testosterone would have been from 35.2 to 42.3. The increase in total testosterone using the same metrics we just talked about, SHBG of 30, albumin of 4.9 would have been from 1400 to about 1625. So that's slightly more than 200 nanogram per deciliter. And this is just using a ratio that showed a correlation between you know, serum, free testosterone, salivary testosterone, um, from another paper, and this, these subjects were males, but they had a couple dozen male controls yep. that they did this correlation on. Yep. So the data there, I mean, it, it's very different. And this is probably part of the reason we don't use salivary to clinically measure testosterone levels is because Unless of the variability. Unless you're a telemedicine TRT clinic. Do some of them do that? I, There's I've clinics seen... that will start, uh, or usually functional medicine clinics, will start testosterone in males and females just based off of a salivary testosterone. I've seen them do it based off urine testing, and I've seen them do it based off of like finger prick testing. Blood spot testing as well, yep. Yeah, but I've not Any, seen goes. salivary. Yep. Wow. I've also seen nothing. Yeah, all you need is a CMP. <laughs> yep. Um, you can just, I forget who it was, but somebody famously said, I can just look at a guy or a girl and just tell if they have low T. But anyway, that's uh, not really a topic for this paper. One other thing um, regarding if someone's like alpha or not alpha, some of the OGs might remember my um, post on the study that looked at dog cortisol and testosterone levels depending on how their owners acted around them and depending on if they won or lost. So the more alpha dogs um, or the more alpha owners or whatnot that had the higher testosterone, their dogs had higher cortisols um, and they accounted for how they treated them. So mm -hmm. it's not like the higher T dog owners. There was were, no toxic masculinity in no, that study. They were not mean to their dogs. Um, you know, it's, uh, if they love their dogs. They were not like narcissists. If you don't like a dog, then you're probably, there's probably some personality disorder there. Um, I feel like all normal humans love dogs, like puppies, dogs, they're great. But, um, the uh, cortisol, at least the salivary cortisol levels, assuming they were done at the same time of the day, did go up. And we do see this anecdotally with cortisol and DHEA for people on Tonkat. So I thought that that was reasonable. However, they went up the exact same amount in the placebo group. So perhaps some of these people were a little bit excited to get their test result when they came up on four weeks. So that probably explains the cortisol. Or maybe they're... Um, uh, you know, it could be random variation because it was a pretty small change. Yeah. I mean, it's, I think, random. The uh, You can see that with the even larger p-value for the cortisol compared yep. to the testosterone. Yep. So not not a huge change there and would not put any stock into it. So yeah. some so, people got excited about their uh, follow-up lab. Yeah, so now I'll say some good things about the study. So they used an adequate dose, Tom Kettley. They used 400 milligrams. So not the absolute highest dose, but a reasonable dose. They didn't give someone like 10 milligrams and say, oh, look, it doesn't work. Um, they're studying a popular supplement. 
So there's relatively higher stakes there. You can show it does work, doesn't work. Yep. Um, I wish they would have done it on Fedoja, but maybe they can do Fedoja with our materials and methods. Yeah, specifically Agrestus. Yeah. And not the other species of the genus. Yep. Uh, it was randomized, double blind, and placebo controlled. That's very rare in supplement trials. It, it was it was good, like high level science. They just didn't get the details how they should. Yep. Trained individuals in both genders. So you know, that's a population that you know is probably the target person that's mm -hmm. going out and getting Tonkhead Ali. Like a very high percentage yep. of those people want to boost their testosterone, break through a plateau, as you had mentioned. Yep. So I think that's a great group. You know, we can kind of, we're sad that the genders were not sort of separated and yep. being able to see the data for both of those groups. Um, but, you know, it was good to see both included because the majority of the studies have been done on men. Yeah, and uh, Tonkat is potentially even more helpful for a lot of females than for a lot of males. Yeah, I mean, particularly with, uh, like you mentioned, oral contraceptives, higher SHBG. Yep, um, a lot of people have improved libido. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it's uh, extremely helpful. I'd love to see a study just on females so that there's not that extra noise or they could run two identical studies and kind of publish the data together, which is what I'd kind of imagined this as being. Um, and then depending on what outcome they're looking at, um, again, I don't think many people, there. I mean, I'm sure there's always some, but most people are not recommending Tongcat or Long Jack as it used to be called or of uricominones mm. for body composition changes. They're usually recommending it for symptoms of lower testosterone, um, whether it is, you know, libido or whether it's energy drive, um, just like generally effort feeling good. Um, just like people generally recommend, like people aren't taking rhodiola to get a better body composition outcome pre-workout. That's not why um, probably a lot of the authors in here have stakes in supplement companies that have rhodiola as a supplement. In fact, I think this was studied by a company, or this study was funded by a company, at least in part, got a grant from a company that has that. Um, and you're taking that to feel better as an ergogenic aid. And that is a very difficult thing to study. Um, any scientist would tell you that. Yes, you can do questionnaires and placebo, like, and, and it has been done with rhodiola. Um, so that's kind of a, a strength, but also a limitation. Um, because they studied in body as their primary outcome, the sleep, the mood, the strength, the testosterone levels, um, any secondary outcome is going to be a lesser outcome. For example, if it is a astrological sign. Yeah, <laughs> that's one of my favorite studies of all time. And I think you do need a little bit longer of a time horizon if you are looking to see, does it actually change body composition? It'd be very difficult to see a change in four weeks. I mean... 12 weeks is kind of what we see as like a, a good study for, you know, body composition, mass accrual, yep. uh, usually with different training protocols. So you would actually have to delve in and see what their training is, put them on something, you know, standardized and see, you know, does Tom Catalyse seem to augment this if it's sort of a phytoandrogen potentially? Yeah. Or if the, I'll say it's relatively small on average, the increase in testosterone. I think the yep. highest I've seen in a, study average was just shy of 200 nanogram per deciliter. Mm -hmm. um, so for some people that can be substantial and then they are training more consistently, they feel like they recover better. So you could make the case that for the right individual, it could make a difference in their body composition, especially over a long period of time. Yeah. So I, I suppose for the right person that would help, a lot of times when people come in uh, like, let's say there's a 20-year-old female or a 24-year-old male, and they're asking, you know, should I get on testosterone replacement therapy? And they're, you know, perhaps they have a low normal testosterone, and perhaps they have symptoms. And if it's a low normal testosterone and they're symptomatic, then a reasonably well-tolerated supplement like Tongcat with, um, you know, I'd say at this point, no significant clinical evidence to improve body composition, they are not taking it for body composition, but there's a lot less relative adverse effect risk than putting all of those people on TRT. Because they might go to their, you know, functional ob and get their testosterone cream, which silently virilizes them and leatherizes their skin. And they're like, oh, I, the female's like, I feel great. 
I just put this testosterone cream and then it all five alpha reduces the DHT in my skin. And, um, you know, uh, my hair's falling out and I have, you know, breakouts all the time. And for some reason, it's just like, like it's just kind of like thick leather. I've had to spend a lot more money at the med spa recently, but you know, they think it's worth it where perhaps Tomcat could give them some of those, um, mental benefits. And of course, the same thing for a male that's trying to avoid just hopping on TRT, which, um, as long as they're 30 years old, apparently every single clinic will just throw them on regardless. That seems to be the pattern that we would see. Yep. Another, you know, good thing about this study is it's open access. So this allowed us to take a really granular look at the study. You know, they had a lot of good tables, a lot of good information in there. Mm -hmm. So it allowed us to kind of look and understand the methods as opposed to things that are locked behind a paywall that we just can't get access to. I, it's probably dozens of papers we've come across sort of in this vein about a supplement or a certain intervention, and we just can't get in and see the data. All we have access to is the abstract. Yep. So great to see publishing open access. Yep, uh, we've we published open well access ourselves. before. Yep. It does cost money. We do pay that money. Um, I'd say the money we've spent on publishing open access for the few articles that we've posted and the ones that we're working on is for sure more than all of the money we've earned, like checks from media companies combined in the last three years of the podcast. No, for sure. Yep. So... Um, there's some transparency there, but yeah, those are a lot of strengths. So, um, yeah, if you don't want to hear weaknesses, then you can stop listening at this point, I suppose. But, uh, we've already really mentioned this, um, in body for evaluating body composition changes and that being the primary clinical input, um, after four weeks. Yeah. We mentioned, you know, the salivary mm -hmm. testosterone levels, the levels were taken post exercise, which, um, you know, is not time that you typically would evaluate even a serum testosterone level. Yeah. Not clear right. when the baseline levels were taken, but I would imagine they were post-exercise as well for consistency. Um, we don't know what the resistance training protocol was, a short, small sample size, common in supplement trials, yep. not a huge deal. Um, they told them not to change their diet, but they didn't really monitor diet. Um, mm -hmm. You know, maybe the one of the group were all keto dieters. You know, just a random example. Um, they also measured hand grip strength, and it would have been nice to see leg press or squat strength um, as a, an outcome, especially since uh, it's only four weeks. And then we already mentioned we'd like to see at least 12 weeks. Yeah, so a longer duration. Um, so you, know, you mentioned the donations, the CBD company, uh, the author, Dr. Uh, Antonio, he's a PhD, and um, he was sort of sharing and thanking people for sharing this on Twitter. Yep. And I saw one of these, I was like, oh, you know, this is my sort of excitement and then disappointment. I said, oh, you know, great to see this being studied. You know, thank you. And asked if they could comment on the you know, why salivary testosterone and why specifically post-exercise. Um, and then there were crickets. So yep. I re responded to him directly, got a notification. And I'm sure he read it. We are here to help if you are listening to this. Yep. And we, we are friends. We are on the same team. Yep. yep. And then here are the, I guess we could have placed these at the beginning, uh, but these are the two physicians who um, you know, shared the study and said that, you know, hey, you know, this Tom Kettle it's not working. Um, here's the study. You know, I don't think that they actually read it in any level of detail because I don't think either one of them would advocate for um, at the most basic level, salivary testosterone to nope. measure. Well, I don't know if these individuals know about that because it seems very basic and rudimentary to us because that's our field. But perhaps it's not as well known outside of, um, you know, hormone management expertise. Um, but what is known is that a lot of these individuals have their own supplement companies to which they want people to stop buying things from the supplement company that makes Tomcat and buy things from their company. So pretty clear conflict of interest there. Yeah, that's true. Um, so I think that's what we have. So this study does not prove that Tomcat Ali does not work. Um, even if you take it at you know, face level and face value and sort of dissect yeah. and correlate and try and figure out what the salivary testosterone means, it looks like there is an increase. Yep. Um, and maybe it doesn't reach statistical significance. Mm -hmm. There was a paper that 
um, not too, too long ago, maybe six months or so, um, showed that there was no clinic or statistically significant difference in young male and old male testosterone levels. But I think it was a couple hundred nanogram per deciliter. And the free testosterone discrepancy was even more than that. Yep. But it didn't reach statistical significance. Correct. So in our line of work, in our field, and looking at hormones, we're able to look at things, sort of you know, run a fine tooth comb over the studies and say, well, you know, this may not be statistically significant, but if you have a 33% increase in your free testosterone, that's, that's going to be pretty significant. Yep. Some things can be statistically significant, but not clinical significant, like aspirin not working if you have certain astrological signs. And then some things cannot be statistically significant. For example, almost anything in a small RCT, but still end up being clinically significant. And then one other takeaway I think is a good microcosm of the basically social media influencer um, trying to help, but really harming. And by trying to help, I mean trying to help the pocketbook of their company, but really harming is this study, the primary endpoint, again, was body composition. So, if you read the study, that's what it says. And all of the headlines are about Tongkat Ali not increasing free testosterone, no mention of salivary testosterone. So if I was writing a headline, maybe we will do this, is say, Tongkat Ali does increase salivary testosterone, but not to statistical significance. That's your asterisk there. Yep. So hopefully that's a, a good takeaway, but that's one of the things we love about long form podcasts or medium long, medium yeah, form Maybe podcasts. this is a medium. Yeah, medium, uh, shmedium, uh, hopefully as short as possible, but is we actually have time to explain those things and hopefully people will appreciate that. Yeah, absolutely. So let us know what additional you know, questions or comments you have. Um, if the authors of this happen to come across this podcast, we'd love to be involved in any future studies specifically evaluating you know, hormone health, you know, athletics. Those are two of our passions that we share. Mm -hmm. So let us know how we did. And if you have any questions or comments, please leave those below. As always, thank you for your time. Thank you for listening. May God bless you with health and happiness.